everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to change your state of consciousness and awareness to live an ecstatic life, then do we have the Peak Brain Show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Andrew Hill, who holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA and continues to do research on attention and cognition. He's also a leading peak performance coach. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about changing your brain to be in a state of peak performance and ecstasy. That plus we'll talk about triumph motorcycles, six-hour tattoos, (laughs) West African Malinke drums, Lobster men and catching crawfish, polyrhythm in the Lion King, spinning pigeons who hop on one leg, and what in the world drumming on mountaintops has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Andrew. Are you ready to shine? I hope so. Excellent and a mighty woohoo! And thank All you right, for woo. being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So before we dive right into things, I was talking to you briefly off air about about where you grew up, where I grew up. Can you take us back, way on back, what were you like in first grade? Uh, In first grade, I uh, I, I grew up in a town called Westport, Massachusetts, which is a little farming town that was mostly defunct with farmers by the time I was living there sort of a mostly vacant town, Uh, really active fishing industry, but um, not a lot beyond that. So in first grade, uh, I was in a little public school, and it was a heavily Portuguese area. So we were eating Portuguese food in school lunches, and all my friends were, you know, speaking Portuguese, and uh, it was this fairly, you know, deep ethnic part of Massachusetts, oddly enough, that I grew up in, um, in spite of being a pretty pale, you know, blonde, blue-eyed kind of, uh, you know, Irishman. Um, but uh, I was one of these rambunctious, inquisitive, hyperactive little ADHD monsters pretty much when I was a kid, uh, uncontrollable by teachers, parents, pretty much anyone. Yeah. Yeah. You understand that, that you, you resemble that remark a little uh, bit. Well, my first parent teacher conference, my mom was told that, uh, two teachers with 32 years of teaching experience, I was the worst student they had ever had in their lives. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I got quite that, uh, accolade. Um, but I was trying, uh, <laughs> some ways for, for, for teachers. And I was also one of these kids who took everything apart. You know, I had to know how things worked. I had to know what, what facts were and how information worked and, uh, physical machines and took apart clock radios and lights and much to the chagrin of my father would blow fuses in the house frequently as I was trying different electrical uh, forays, so to speak. Yeah, I get it. Uh, There was a Tyco train set. I think I did something with the transformer and I remember plugging it in and out of the wall and getting buzzed and like jumping back and having my brain buzzing for minutes afterwards. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's something very similar. So if we fast forward from there, would you mind sharing what happened with your brother in seventh grade and how that kind of shifted you? Yeah. So my brother, Alex, uh, who's a really nice guy and he's, you know, to the, to start at the end, he's a fine, intact, intelligent guy now. Yeah. But when he was in first grade and I was in sixth or seventh, um, this of course is in Massachusetts and it snows in Massachusetts most years. And, uh, in the late winter, um, he sledded out into the street uh, and got hit by a car. Uh, He got sort of pinned between a car and a tree and took the tree down uh, and destroyed part of his, uh, the junction of his frontal, temporal, and parietal lobe, sort of the right insula area. Mm -hmm. And um, was in a coma for several weeks. And the, the change in consciousness that he experienced from what, you know, I thought at the time was a fairly small injury. I mean, a very, you know, small little part of his brain was impacted, produced a pretty profound change in consciousness, obviously, and it took him some time to come out of that state. And then he had to spend some time learning to you know, walk again and develop complex language stuff again, um, had a lot of attention problems. He would, after that, sit and watch the TV and be clicking through channels, never stopping. He, the, the act of changing channels, he would get stuck on. Mm-hmm. And so this was like, he, he was a very young uh, guy at the time, uh, thankfully, the earlier, the, the, the younger you are when you receive significant brain injuries, the less likely you are to have any specific problem later in life. And so this is true of, of my brother. Over the next several years, he really uh, sort of came back and, and relearned all the skills he needed to and eventually was successful and went to college and graduated. And, you know, he has a more traditional life than I do. He's got a wife and three kids and lives in rural Maine. And he's a 
a chef. He tends to do a lot of um, food service and mm-hmm. cooking, and he's a you know one of these sort of big jolly chef kind of guys. Uh, so he's actually living a pretty traditional life these days, in spite of having a pretty dramatic challenge um, that he had to overcome in the first you know few years of his life. So very cool. And it sounds like if he's very if he's very jolly, he kind of got the big picture early on. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So how did it steer your um, well educational path or direction in life? Yeah, so at the time, uh, you know, again, the, the, the change in consciousness was very telling, very startling that he had this small injury and a big change in consciousness. Well, what and what's that, got, that mean, the change in consciousness? Well, I mean, he was unconscious for weeks. He was in a coma. Um, and it, it wasn't sleep. It wasn't a profound injury as far as we can I mean, He had, a, you know, some scars and some brain surgery and some plates in his head. But it wasn't like he lost half of his brain or anything. And so it was very striking that he wasn't conscious, he wasn't aware, and yet he wasn't asleep. So that started me thinking about, well, what is consciousness? What is the mind? Uh, how does it differ from the brain? Uh, how does it differ even moment to moment as we experience you know, variability in our days? Some days we're stressed, some days we're energetic, some days we're tired. You know, what is going on in terms of the underpinnings of our experience? Um, this dovetailed with my desire to take things apart and be very mechanical about intervening, and over the next 20 years or so, I ended up working in pretty much every aspect of mental health and human services you can imagine. So I worked with um, multiply disabled, retarded adults in group home settings. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked with uh, people in dual diagnosis, uh, alcohol and psychiatric uh, inpatient crisis environments. Ended up working in one of the most acute psych hospitals in the state of Massachusetts for a few years where we had a, a children's floor, a geriatric floor, and an adult floor. And so for a few years, I saw every possible you know, extreme psychiatric problem. I ended up working in uh, outpatient for a few years, ended up doing work with autistic spectrum and other you know, not neurotypical developmental issues like ADHD or you know, other, other types of uh, developmental problems. Um, and over many, many years, I you know, saw that humans are quite variable and, and brains and minds are quite variable. And then uh, toward the end of that time, the, the last job I had was working in a neurofeedback center in Providence. Mm-hmm. And we saw mostly autistic spectrum and ADHD people. And up until then, I mean, I'd worked a lot with all kinds of individuals. And my perspective on mental health, mental fitness was that when things go awry, we largely just manage symptoms. We don't actually create change. Uh, For a few years I was a, or for a year and a half or so, I was a clinical case manager in an inpatient locked facility for latency age, a four to 10 year old uh, kids unit. And when I started working in that unit, it was really dramatic how profoundly well people changed when you took them out of the environment that was supporting the crisis or the mental health problem. So I saw that kids had this resiliency still, mm-hmm. and you know the adults with psychiatric stuff or alcoholism or other things, it was much more of a revolving door in and out of a clinic. But the kids often, you could stabilize and create a safe space for a few days, architect some changes in the home or school environment, send them home uh, more resilient and with more resources, and they often didn't come back the same way adults did. So I was already seeing that kids were a little more resilient and I was curious if we could bring this resilience, this changeability uh, up in any way. And I started looking into something called neurofeedback, which is biofeedback on the brain. And then when I went to work in Providence for a place called the Neurodevelopment Center, uh, Dr. Larry Hirschberg, who's still there, does great work, mm-hmm. um, I started seeing pretty amazing things. I started seeing autism symptoms drop away. I started seeing ADHD go away in a few months for many people. And when you have a nonverbal, you know, self stimming autistic kid who's very uh, hard to handle behaviorally, and when that kid settles a little bit, makes eye contact, and maybe even produces some language, it's very exciting. So, you know, seeing those kind of changes. Um, and we're seeing these kind of changes in neurofeedback in the course of weeks and months, not years. So I went from, you know, 20 years of working in traditional health and human services, inpatient, outpatient, residential where a lot of the, the work was just maintaining people's d- safety, support um, with uh, dramatically impaired people. I remember one year I spent teaching a gentleman to use a fork. That was our big accomplishment that year. You know, he was nonverbal, blind, uh, profoundly retarded, 
had cerebral palsy and some other developmental issues and lots of things going on. And we spent a year working with an adaptive fork to teach him so he could actually, you know, feed himself without, uh, uh, just using his hands. And that was my, my big accomplishment that year. That felt great. Soon after that, I went and worked inpatient because mm-hmm. I thought that, okay, with psychiatric stuff versus developmental stuff, at least there's some chance for change. We're actively intervening. Still didn't see a lot of active change in psychiatry. Um, certainly not in inpatient environments where there's sort of a revolving door uh, with adults. Um, and then I went and worked in neurofeedback and had my mind blown, no pun intended, Again and again and again, people started changing. And it happened more often than not that within a few months, we could make brain changes that people have been trying to get for years and years through other mechanisms, medication, therapy, behavioral interventions. And you touch the brain with neurofeedback and things just unfold for many people. So this got very, um, I got very excited about this, this mm-hmm. tractability, this technology that seemed to be able to, in a very you know, reliable way, reach in and change the brain. Uh, and that started me on a path of grad school and doing research into the brain. And, you know, several years after that, I'm now uh, the owner of a couple of uh, companies that try to provide accessibility of brain services to more and more people. We're, you know, neurofeedback is not a new thing in this country. It's been around since the late 60s. There's probably only about 5,000 practitioners in the U.S. Um, and probably only twice that worldwide. So my current goals and missions are about access to the technology, bringing uh, the way that we do neurofeedback out of the medical space where one very skilled individual has to have all the knowledge in their head and bringing it down to more of a fitness modality where you can have teams of people doing assessments and come up with treatment plans. And then people can engage with this as fitness, not as, you know, interventions to fix a problem necessarily. I like that. And I'm going to want to talk in a little bit more about the fitness aspect because we're often told, well, from IQ tests on forward, from tests even before that, what you have is what you've got and you're done. That's it. That's over. You're an ADHD. You're a this. You're a bipolar. Yeah. That's the end of the story. And, and it's only the beginning of the story. Yeah, and it's not even true at all. I mean, brains change. Shift happens. If you have a brain, it will change, period. Um, and so the idea that things are not changeable has been born out of this experience of us trying to maintain or control psychiatric problems, and all we can really do is be palliative. We don't have the ability to cure a lot of psychiatric stuff with psych meds. They, they manage symptoms. Mm-hmm. And so working in neurofeedback, uh, it's, a, it's a change perspective. We think of people as finishing the process after a few months for many things. Um, and that was a... a So diametrically opposed perspective from all of the other mental health, health and human services work I had done. So I I really do believe that not only are brains changeable and you shouldn't tolerate if you have ADHD or anxiety or sleep issues, but we should be engaging with brain health the same way we engage with body health. You know, now we know that having a spare tire around your middle means you have increased cardiovascular risk. Well, we care about that to some extent because we know we have risk factors, but mm-hmm. also because we look at magazines and, and abs are socially, you know, reinforced. Oh, you got to look good. And so people work on their bodies. We have the same degree of tractability of brain stuff. You can tune up, build resources, get rid of problems in your brain and actually faster than your body. The brain's whole job is to change. And so it tends to change under any sort of manipulation very well. Um, brain changes or neurofeedback works better on anything we do than any other intervention. I was listening to a show with yours, a recording of yours, and you were talking about the piano and one hour of practicing the piano, which is intriguing to me because I have a 76-year-old dad who's taken the piano back up this year. And Uh my father-in-law has just said, uh, you and Jessica, my wife Jessica and I were moving. He's like, I I was gifting you the baby grand, but actually I want to hold on to it and start taking piano lessons (laughs) at about 76 myself. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. That's great. Yeah. So, so your dad, after a single lesson, the uh, hand area of the motor cortex, you know, lots of cells are, are talking to each other via synapses. Every single cell will move around and remap its connections to other cells. And this happens on the order of minutes. So when you start learning something physically, mm-hmm. your brain starts moving within moments to accommodate the ask and to create new synapses. And then at night, any strong synapses are consolidated, reinforced. And any weak synapses are washed away, 
and the next day the process starts again. So yeah, your dad will develop new uh, mapping, new connections between cells, but he will also be able to keep new cells he's building uh, more. So we're always making new brain cells. Your dad, even at 76, is continually making new neurons. But about half the neurons we make don't survive to be used as actual cells. You have to incorporate them to networks for them to survive. Do the brain, does that um, increasing in the um, hand coordination in other parts of the mind, does that carry over into other areas? And does, is there, as you start to build up your strength of your brain, does it make it mm -hmm. easier for more change or is it too specific? It, it, it can. Uh, things that are similar often uh, have transfer where you develop a similar task and you can use a similar skill in a different area you aren't an expert in and have accelerated learning at least. And this is because adjacent categories have some shared you know, overlap of resources. Um, the other piece of that is that anything you're doing to your brain that makes learning happen enhances plasticity. So if you are taking the piano and meditating and eating, I don't know, a uh, high fat, low carb diet, and studying a language, all of those things sort of function stack. And before mm -hmm. you know it, you're getting transformation without really any uh, need to, to search for it. Um, human performance and human transformation work suggests that when you stack a few interventions, you start getting sort of discontinuous change versus a linear change. Things become sort of uh, leveled up uh, when you add in multiple interventions. So for your dad, his he's not going to have... Um, He's not going to increase the amount of new brain cells he's generating, mm -hmm. but he'll incorporate the brain cells he's making into networks better. So more of those potential cells will survive into becoming networks. Awesome. And, and I would uh, just thinking out loud about this, as you start to learn something new, a new skill for piano, you actually gain strength and maybe it's the courage to learn another new skill. There's confidence that you're gaining from it. Sure. Yeah. Success breeds more success. Um, if your experience of learning is always it's always perfect, the first time you hit a challenge, you give up. Mm -hmm. If you are in the process, if your if your mode is to engage with effortful things where there's risk of failure or imperfect performance, then you're used to that. You're used to variable performance, and you know how to power through or take a momentary failure. As just that, not as a referendum on your ability to learn or to progress. Maybe you can tell us about going to the top of the mountain, something that it sounds like sure. you did on some sort of a regular basis, and then I'm interested yeah. in how you are integrating that so that you're not running up to the top of the mountain once a week. Yeah, so um, for about 15 or 20 years, I would do two or three events a year where we would find a mountaintop and bring you know a couple hundred to several hundred people that we liked the mountaintop and from about dusk until dawn for several days in a row we would have you know non-ending drum dance song chant fire kind of events uh because of this synthetic thing i'm mentioning the drumming that tended to show up across these several hundred people is actually west african drumming of a specific type called malinke or manding or mandingo or mande there's all equivalent terms um this sort of section of West Africa that involves, uh, it's around Mali, essentially. Um, there's other drumming that got in too. We have a lot of uh, Middle Eastern drumming. But Middle Eastern drumming doesn't support the same kind of trance work and ecstatic work that West African drumming does. Okay. And so creating a very strong sonic container in, in these events or these, these weeks, we go up to a mountaintop, uh, we create a fire pit with a little circle around it, you know, 10 or 15 feet around. And some people are drumming, some people are dancing, some people are just holding space, some people are watering the dancers and drummers, they don't fall over and die, some people are smudging you into the space you know, uh, with sage so that mm -hmm. you can kind of leave your outside world behind. Um, but the point is you create this sort of sonic and uh, community container within which we provide opportunity for people to do whatever work they need to do without any cosmology imposed. So... This is getting back to what I was saying earlier. The pagan community has become much more lay over the time, over the past you know few decades, and now a lot of these events are sort of non-denominational. We don't necessarily require or insist or ask that anyone believe anything. It's about having your own genuine experience, and for many people in the in the scene that I tend to participate in, that experience is pushing yourself around a circle you know, hundreds and hundreds of times all night long until your conscious mind is either exhausted or pushed out of the way. 
and then you have sort of either subtle experiences of awareness or potentially dramatic, you know, breakthrough uh, experiences. And and those happen. Uh, there's both valid experiences that can happen to people and change how they feel when they leave. So to get into your other question, when I was doing this for one week a year for the first few years, I would have by about day three, I would sort of be in this completely egoless, blissed out, happy with everything in my life very accepting, very loving kind of state. Mm -hmm. And then I would go back to my life, which was stressful. I was working in psych hospitals and, you know, working 80 hours a week and dealing with very critical, you know, extreme things that people were struggling with. And after about a month and a half of that, this sort of veneer or gloss of, you know, equanimity and love would be gone, utterly gone. But to answer your, your question, you know, how do I maintain that? Through practice. So uh, the first couple of years, I'd come down to the mountain and be altered for maybe even a couple of weeks and then kind of come back to ground and back to my own ruts and habits and attachments and fears and pains and, you know, like many of us do. And then I started doing that two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of us. There's probably about 10,000 people who will travel to one of these events. There's about a dozen a year all throughout the country and the world. And I have friends that I've seen all over the world um, for 20 years, but I have no idea where they live. I have no idea what's going on in their lives, what kind of job they have. I have some friends I've never spoken to, but I have deep relationships with from years of sitting next to them, you know, drumming and checking in with their rhythmic you know, control, but I've never talked to them. And it's a deep, intimate kind of relationship, being a musician with somebody and we develop this sort of non-cognitive relationships by coming together to create this ecstatic space and then allow people to have transformations. Mm -hmm. So it's created a really nice network of, of friends and family over the past you know, few decades. Um, but we are a little you know, dispersed throughout the world. So I, I still do make an, an attempt to do at least one of these a year. Mm -hmm. But I found after about six or seven or eight years of doing this that the post-event kind of glow – started to change. And it didn't so much become an alteration of who I was, but it became a baseline shift. And so after five or six or seven years, maybe eight years, I would leave the event pretty much how I started, which is actually much less reactive, attached, stressed. Um, and I would actually enter these environments like I would normally have left them you know, in the first few years. So it was really just practice, just learning to drop into that state um, and this is actually before I had a regular day-to-day -day, you know, meditation practice or yoga practice or anything mm -hmm. else. So my spirituality was done in these intense chunks for you know, a week, once or twice a year. And after doing that for many, many years, it started to stick. And I had this different spiritual perspective and I had gone out of my own you know, conscious mind far enough with different experiences that I sort of knew the shape of my conscious mind and where it broke down and what you know, where the identity, the I, wasn't necessarily uh, important. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that can happen in, in shamanic or ecstatic experiences is this dis or, or de-identification that a lot of spiritual people talk about across many religions, be it Christianity or Buddhism. This idea that if you identify with the I, the capital I, too much, then you cause suffering. You resist things. You don't like how things are. You rail against reality. And so that almost Buddhist equanimity arose through doing ecstatic work mm -hmm. and just getting out of my own way enough for many, many years. And then a little more recently, maybe 10 years ago now, I started a little more active meditation practice and mindfulness work. And of course, I've been doing neurofeedback that whole time. So that really ties into my understanding of the mind and the brain. What's the importance then of getting out of our head and what ways would you recommend we do it so we're not having to travel to the top of the mountain? You know, again, this is a Buddhist perspective. Um, you know, traditional Buddhists would say that meditation leads to equanimity. Equanimity is being okay with how things are. That sounds, you know, pretty straightforward, but it's, it's very subtle. It, it, it has this component of not allowing your ego identity to be offended or get defensive mm -hmm. when the world doesn't line up with how you think it should. And so you have to have this almost dissonant state of knowing things suck, yeah. but knowing that that's how things are sometimes. Not being okay with the pain or the suffering, but also not railing against it as being unfair. It just is what it is. 
And so for me, that equanimity came out of this ecstatic process initially. And then I found that I could fairly easily build that, that reflex, that muscle of equanimity through meditation. And so, you know, it's not sustainable to put yourself in an ecstatic state for a few days every week. You just wouldn't ever get any work done, right? <laughs> Uh, and sometimes it's physically taxing. Sometimes you need to recover from ecstatic experiences for a few days. Maybe you didn't stop dancing for three days in a row, and now your knees and legs and ankles hurt. You got blisters everywhere. I, I heard Maybe. that turned you into a, a drummer from a dancer. It did actually. Yeah, I, uh, I, I the first years I was involved with that community, I was more on the like I'm going to bang on drums and you know support these what well, uh, dancers whatever. And then one year I blew out my plantar fascia on both of my feet. Um, it was a rocky field that I got basically tore my, my, uh, the bottom of my feet on. And so that was the first day of an eight day event. And, uh, okay. So I had to just sit and actually work on the drum a little bit. But before that I would drum, get bored, go dance, and then just dance the rest of the, of the week. Mm -hmm. But after I injured myself, I had to sit and actually drum and get past the boredom. Um, something people may not know about drumming in these environments is drummers don't actually have ecstatic experiences. They can't. Drummers don't trance out. In a Native American shamanism kind of environment, they can. It's a repetitive pulse almost that is played without variability. And so the drummer themselves can go, can journey, can travel. But in a West African style drumming, it's polyrhythm where you're always staying checked in with everyone else around you. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of West African style of supporting dancers is to modify what you're doing in response to how the dancers are feeling and behaving. And so the dr the bench, the drummer side of the equation in these environments is staying very checked in, very alert, very communicative with the vibe, the sound, the music, what's happening with the dancers, with other people you're drumming with. And there's a huge amount of nonverbal communication because you can't talk over the drums um, with 30 or 40 or 50 people all night long for several nights in a row. This is why you know, we develop these deep, you know, nuanced understanding of each other and maybe never having an actual conversation with some wow. of these folks. Both Jessica and I, we both have a dembe, a djembe, I don't even, I've never learned how to pronounce it, but we both have a couple African drums. Her is much smaller Great. than mine. It's very cute. And, uh -huh. and when, when we play them together, something special happens, something clicks. And I've heard that if you have coupled challenges, if you have problems with somebody, drum with them. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's communication, but it's communication that, that does not allow all the things you think are true about you know, how to present yourself or how people are going to view the words you've picked. If it's simply time and sound and you have to match somebody, you know, you're always observing their subtle fluctuations. They're always observing yours. And so you end up communicating with them without even realizing you're, you're staying in, in step with them, so to speak. So take us from there, and, and I want to talk more about getting out of the mind. What does meditation now look like to you? Yeah. Um, for me, meditation is a couple things. One is, is it's simply mindfulness practices, which uh, I like to define mindfulness. The traditional definition is, uh, or my, my spin on the traditional definition is, mindfulness is paying attention in a specific way mm -hmm. to the present moment on purpose. And then I usually add replacing judgment with curiosity. I like it. You know, having, having a sense of investigation versus evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, mindfulness and meditation and, and basically any, of, any form of this work is directed or anchored attention. It's executive function training. And so if you train your mind to be more stable in attention, mm -hmm. that produces all of the other things that are more spiritual over time. So I used to have a really robust daily meditation practice. I would do 20 minutes a day um, on the cushion before anything else. And that's wonderful. It changes your whole day. It affects how you, how you walk through the world. And over time, it builds resources. You know, really well scientifically validated uh, research now shows big change when you meditate. Even 20 minutes a day can offset ADHD, can offset uh, aging, a few other things. So it's really good research. After a few years of that, um, I discovered uh, Ashtanga yoga. Mm -hmm. And Ashtanga is a little different than other forms um, in that you always learn the same sequence when you're learning Ashtanga. It's always the same series of poses. And most traditional Ashtanga places uh, are not a class. They're a self-paced practice in an open time block. 
So you show up, you practice for as hard as uh, for as long as you want, with as much difficulty as you want, do as much as you want or as little as you want, as fast or as slow as you like. And there's nobody talking to you and walking you through, do this, do this. I mean, they, they teach you your first few days there, but once you know some of the practice, you go in and you practice. And it's repetitive motion, breathing, and, and direction of gaze. So with these repetitive body things mm -hmm. and no one talking to you, I found very quickly in doing Ashtanga that I could get as good a workout as hitting the gym and banging out weights for an hour and a half and as good a meditation as sitting for a half-day workshop for four hours in about an hour in the Ashtanga studio. I wasn't quite so beaten up like a too hard gym workout and it didn't take as much time as doing a half-day retreat for meditation. And so for me, Ashtanga has largely replaced other forms of mindfulness because, and forms of exercise because it seems to get me all of the mental and physical stretching that I need to get to maintain resources about being less reactive, uh, more balanced, et cetera. What is it doing specifically, do you think, to the mind? I don't know is the short answer. Um, there's lots of things happening in yoga. I'm not an expert in yoga. I'm just a student. Um, but you know, when you are physically um, moving, you're driving blood through the brain quite a lot. Met met metabolism goes up. Body temperature goes way up as evidenced by the pounds of sweat you drop. Um, I think the lack of speech allows certain brain waves to climb mm -hmm. that are deeply – relaxing sort of in a, in a non-cognitive way. Um, a lot of the, I think the benefits, a lot of the magic from anything you do, be it mindfulness or yoga or meditation, uh, the magic seems to come in a special place where the conscious mind, the verbal mind, is no longer exceptionally engaged. Um, language shapes thought. And so if you're having lots of words popping through your mind, the, sh the, the direction your thoughts take through your experience is bounded by those words. Mm -hmm. And so um, be it sitting on a cushion meditating for 20 minutes or doing an hour-long Ashtanga practice, without the verbal uh, reinforcer to keep the linear mind engaged, you're able to drop into a more of a meditative state. And so this is, this is probably true for me to some extent because I had a meditation history and some skills in that. So my, my mind was like, oh, this thing I'm doing with my body, this kind of feels like meditation. Oh, look at that. I can meditate while doing this. That's kind of cool. But it wasn't like I decided, oh, I'm going to see if I can really meditate while doing Ashtanga. It was leaving Ashtanga going, well, that was interesting. I think I just meditated. I wasn't really planning on it, but I was you know, just mindfully, effortfully attending mm -hmm. to every step of the process. And that's mindfulness or meditation. Beautiful. What would if somebody wants to get into mindfulness and and they're they're not going to take an a, 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 I can't even pronounce it right Ashtanga, Ashtanga sure a, yeah. a, a, Ashtanga class. What is a very simple way that they can start to practice mindfulness yeah. or start to work on the mind? So um, it doesn't really matter what form of meditation you do. The research suggests that it's the regularity with which you do it that matters. Mm -hmm not if it's transcendental meditation or vipassana or samatha or MBSR or anything else. So I encourage folks again to do a few minutes of stabilization or single point awareness mm -hmm. and then follow that with some time of present time awareness. Single or, point awareness, pick a point, stare at it. For example, yeah. it, could, it could be a, a, a candle, but may, a, a flame, but maybe not from a safety perspective, but get that one, right. one thing that you want to look at. Yeah, and, and I really encourage folks to pick things that are happening around them anyways or mm -hmm. in their body. I mean, you're always carrying your body around with you, so you always have the tools to meditate. Um, the classic way of doing samatha or single point awareness or concentration practices is to feel the air crossing your upper lip. Mm -hmm. Don't follow the air into your body. Just feel it tickle the little, you know, the philtrum, the upper lip here. Mm -hmm. And try to note it's a very subtle sensation, very subtle for some folks. So... I always uh, suggest folks start um, by finding a place to sit where they can sit comfortably, sit with their back away from a chair so you aren't you know, slumping into relaxation too much, or stand if you're too sleepy. If you can't keep your eyes open, uh, if, you, if you're falling asleep while meditating, do it standing. Um, and then anchor your attention, watch that simple sensation, and that's it. 
try to observe the sensation of air as you breathe in and out on that little point. Now, the trick is, since you have a brain, since you have a mind, within moments you are planning, wishing, thinking, remembering, oh, my knee hurts, oh, that girl's cute, oh, I'm hungry. Those are not failures to meditate. Those are opportunities to go, oh, Thank you. I've lost the anchor. Not right now, back to the anchor. Mm -hmm. That anchoring, noticing when you've drifted, letting it go, and re-anchoring, that's the rep of meditation. When I start teaching meditation, people often say, oh, I can't meditate. I can never blank my mind. That is not meditation. Blanking your mind, emptying your mind is not meditation. Sometimes it happens as a consequence of practicing meditation. But the act of meditation is effortful anchoring of your mind, of your attention, on a specific thing. In single point awareness, it's a very narrow, you pack it down to a little tiny awareness. And then after you do that for a few minutes, your mind's actually quieter, a little bit. And so I tell people, if you look at the tutorial on the website, do five minutes of samatha or single point awareness and 15 minutes of present time awareness. Yeah, there's a, there's a great um, timer app that I encourage folks to grab called Insight Timer. And the reason I like it is because it has different bells or chimes you can use. And if you, uh, can, you, you can set it up this way where you have a bell at the beginning and at the end and one five minutes in. So what I like to do is say, okay, for the first five minutes, anchor your attention to here. Mm -hmm. Whenever you drift, let it go back to that, keep packing your attention down, narrower and narrower. And then when that five-minute bell goes off, switch to present time awareness. And for that, you're sort of anchoring your experience, planting your feet almost in a stream of experience, watching thoughts and experiences flow by. Almost like you were sitting on the bank of a river and your mind is the river, or you're standing in the river like a fly fisherman, you know, watching things flow by, but not being carried along with them. And so for this present time awareness or vipassana, it's better to pick a rhythmic or continually changing stimuli. The classic one is watching the breath in your belly and your torso rise and fall. Don't try to control it. Don't mm -hmm. think you have to be super relaxed or breathe slowly. Just observe. So this really falls back to the uh, classic Buddhist instruction for meditation, uh, which was introduced by this guy named Sid. And Sid would say, when you are breathing in, know that you are breathing in. When you are breathing out, know that you are breathing out. So Vipassana is that. It is that awareness, holding your attention on the experience of, of breath in this case. Um, so I encourage folks, five minutes of single point awareness. When the bell chimes, switch to present time awareness. And doing that for 20 minutes is great. If that sounds like it's too challenging, do two minutes of pr uh, single point and then do you know eight of present time. Uh, present, yeah, present time. So you can cut it down to 10 minutes, that's fine. But do something every single day. And then of course there are some classic jokes uh, here. Um, people always ask if you should meditate in the morning or the evening. I encourage folks to try it in the morning first mm -hmm. because it may change your whole day. But you can do it in the evening if you need to let go of the day, that's fine. But if you only have you know, half an hour to meditate, do it in the morning. If you have an hour, maybe split it up. If you don't have an hour to meditate, then you must meditate for two hours. I love that one. <laughs> There's something wrong with, with the way you perceive time and the way you react. If you can't carve out 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I guarantee your listeners, if you start a meditation practice, if this is new for you and you're like, I can't stop my morning routine for 20 minutes, if you do, I guarantee you within a week or two, you'll be getting that time back later on in the day and more because of how efficient and how less reactive your mind's going to be. What do you tell people who say, I don't, um, not I don't know how to meditate, I can't meditate. That's just not me. Yeah. I can't meditate. Well, I, I would uh, try to unpack what they think meditation is. And usually they think it's shutting up their mind. And I have to disabuse them of that knowledge that, okay, well, what you're doing is you're judging your meditation. That's not meditation. Do it. Forget about evaluating it. Just do it. You know, it's going to be boring or hard sometimes. It'll be easy sometimes. But after a couple of weeks of doing this, then tell me what's going on. Because right now you're like, oh, my monkey mind is chattering. I failed. No, actually, that's when you can meditate is when you have an opportunity to disengage from that reactive sort of uh, stimuli. So um, when people say that, it usually means they haven't meditated 
not that they can't. And they have some ideas that are sort of informed by Hollywood about being this beatific, you know, Tibetan Buddhist or something mm -hmm. who's never flapped by anything, whose mind is serene. I mean, I know a few old Tibetan Buddhist dudes. They're not all like that. You know, some of them can they have this sort of glow, this beatific kind of relaxation. But some of them, you know, are anxious and get angry and, you know, aren't terribly excited about their friends some, some days. So you will have variability of experience, be it when you're meditating or when you're walking around. And it's important to learn to accept the variability. If you think you can't meditate, that's really saying – what I hear is I don't want to meditate or I don't understand how to meditate. I, I never believe that you can't meditate because we all – do directed attention every day. So you've had experiences of focusing on one thing and letting other things fall away. That resource may not be as reliably accessible or as strong as you want it, so meditate. And then over time, you get more executive function, more control over the automatic and effortful direction of your mind. It, it develops attention skills and self-control and balance and ease internally over time but the act is not that. The act is not relaxing and beatific and super chill. I mean, it may be, but it doesn't matter if it's not. If your mind's like bang, 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 and you can't shut it up, well, that's what happened for those 10 minutes. That's nothing wrong with that. Even if it didn't feel like you could settle, you still tried. You still practiced the perspective of anchoring your attention. It did do something. And then over time, you'll notice resources come up. So I encourage folks to do those two, Samatha Vipassana, and if they have a lot of you know, anxiety or deep trauma after doing those forms for a mm -hmm. few months, then I recommend people do metta, which is loving kindness or an emotional awareness. Awesome. So, and, and um, that's... But I, oh, go ahead. I'm just saying, I, I, you, you can find lots of other forms of meditation, but for me, those three classics, Samatha, Vipassana, metta, those are really all you really need. Basic techniques, nothing special, no chanting, no mantras, no lead meditations. I think training wheels in, in the form of lead meditation will prevent you from learning the actual skill. Just like real training wheels prevent you from reverse steering in a bike. You know, in a, in a real bicycle, you push the wheel away from you, fall into it, and then catch the turn, right? It's reverse steering. Yep. You can't do that with steering with, with uh, training wheels. And so if you're used to riding a bike and tottering on training wheels, the first thing they're pulled off, you fall over. So if you need a guided meditation to do it, that's one thing. But it's, it's kind of um, uh, a crutch that may prevent you from learning the real skill. So I encourage folks to suffer through the, the 10 minutes of boredom and not thinking they're doing it right and having their butt hurt and their knee hurt and things fall asleep and get hungry. Hey, that's actually meditation. So good job. Woohoo! So I want to talk a few more quick things on the yeah. brain. First off, importance of sleep and just how much does it change the brain? Profoundly. Um, sleep's very, very important for all kinds of things, including uh, every time you sleep, all of the synaptic density that's built up over the day is washed away, mm -hmm. and only the, the, the densest, the tightest synapses are reinforced. That's one form of learning. This is why learning goes down if you don't sleep. Um, the act of moving memory from short to long-term storage also requires sleep, requires delta waves, deep, slow-wave sleep. Um, a chronically sleep-deprived brain looks like a depressed brain on many forms of neuroimaging, including MRIs and some EEG signatures. Uh, and, and then sleep is required for concentration, for attention management, for resiliency. There's so many things in the human experience that just don't work if the resource is not fed through good sleep, but more than that, the architecture, the ability of the brain to fall asleep at will, stay asleep, wake mm -hmm. up when you want to in the morning, and not have delayed onset or broken up sleep throughout the night, those are, are, are indications that your awake brain is functioning uh, well if you can sleep straight through the night, or not so well if you're waking up every hour. You know, so the specific problems we often see in sleep that actually represent problems you really have with your awake brain. And if you can hack your sleep and modify it enough to put it back on track, you can often eliminate or reduce things like depression, anxiety, ADHD, cognitive fatigue, et cetera. So I encourage folks to sort their sleep out before anything else. And then their diet, and then some mindfulness, and then some physical activity. One or two quick sleep hacks. 
So the most powerful sleep hack I'll give you, um, there's a nucleus in the brain that sort of sits behind the optic chiasm, the place the optic nerves cross, mm -hmm. called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the nucleus that sits on top of the X. Um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, its job is to sample the temperature of light being seen by the retina and that tells the brain what time of day it is. There is a specific bandwidth or frequency of light that is prevalent in the air, in sunlight, in the first hour or so after the sun comes up. But once the sun is deeper or higher in the sky, a lot of that bandwidth is reflected back out into space. We don't see it. So our biology has evolved to notice that really special frequency early in the morning, and it's the strongest resetter of circadian entrainment that we have. Mm -hmm. There's many ways we reset circadian entrainment. Activity level, when we wake, when we sleep, how we eat, lots of things affect circadian, you know, late day, daylight cycle entrainment. The strongest one is that that first hour of light after dawn. So if your sleep is not ideal, seven days in a row, get up within an hour after dawn and get a few minutes of light in your face. Open the window, sit on your porch, take your dog for a walk, grab your cup of coffee and sit in the stoop, whatever it takes. A few minutes of that early morning light every day, at some point in that week, you'll suddenly wake up before the alarm you set. The first day it's like, oh, it's 5.30, I can't get up. But by the fourth or fifth or sixth day, you'll spring out of bed crisp and awake and your brain will start ending a sleep cycle at that time of day and really marshalling, you know, raising cortisol to make you spring out of bed and making you feel very crisp and alert and the sleep you get gets a little deeper because you're going to, to bed in the uh, early evening a little more reliably. So that's the most powerful sleep hack is that, is that morning light. Awesome. It's, uh, it's something I've taught ADD clients for years. I used to do a lot of ADHD uh, uh, coaching, wrote a book on it, College Confidence with ADD. And I said the uh -huh. number one thing you want to do is get up and go for a walk first thing in the morning. Get outside to reset the circadian rhythm. But I didn't know about the X. I had no idea. Yep. Yeah, the super cosmetic nucleus is by far the strongest entrainer of circadian rhythms. Um, it's also involved with other things like maternal behavior and parenting and other hormones, but it's a really big resetter of that uh, hypothalamic mm -hmm. or rexin system that, that uh, builds up when you get tired and then gets reset by sleep. What does sugar do to the brain? Yeah, that's absolutely necessary. Uh, sugar drives most of the mental illness things that I know about, especially the aging-related ones. And either it, either it creates problems or it exacerbates problems. You know, now we know that uh, Alzheimer's appears to be a type 3 diabetes. Insulin resistance in the brain causing uh, eventually neurons to die. Mm -hmm. This is why ketogenic and ketone feeding can actually spare neurons and sometimes reverse Alzheimer's symptoms, which is pretty exciting. Um, but sugar, when it oxidizes, produces in the body things like atherosclerosis, which is that sort of inflammation of the interior lining of the, of the arteries and things, which eventually will kill you, uh, or at least cause cardiovascular disease. Um, sugar in the brain, oxidization of, of sugars causes beta amyloid to become uh, more toxic and progresses Alzheimer's. It causes Lewy bodies and Parkinson's to become gl you know, glycated, or the, the edges are oxidized with sugar, and that's when they start really ripping through brain tissue and causing quick progression. So, and then of course, the uh, insulin system in the body, most Westerners, most Americans eat hundreds of grams of carbs a day. And what that means is insulin goes up and stays up. And whenever you have a, a signaling system in the body whose variability is abolished, that's when illness shows up. And sugar is a great way to eliminate variability of insulin. If you're always feeding max levels of, mm -hmm. of sugar, your insulin goes up, stays up. Cells stop listening to insulin, become resistant, start dying. Your pancreas pumps out more insulin. Eventually, you're diabetic because uh, because the, the, the autoimmune thing can happen for type one or type two. So eventually, you destroy the system by overdriving it. And this happens in depression with cortisol. It happens with diabetes and Alzheimer's for insulin. So I'm a big fan of regulatory variability, and you need to maintain sensitivity to the amount of carbohydrates coming in your body, or you lose that sensitivity. Thank you. Is there any sort of uh, biofeedback that you can do at home? We had on uh, Pat Flynn recently, um, yeah. and, and he was talking about a device he loves called Muse. Yeah, unfortunately, no. None of the EEG-based devices that are home are, are worth anything. 
unfortunately including the muse uh, and the big reason is it's a forehead band and the forehead's not the place you want to train when doing neurofeedback generally you always want the motor strip covered you rarely want the forehead covered and because of consumer access and ease of engineering all of these guys that are producing headbands are producing headbands not devices that fit onto the motor strip and even devices like the emotive they fit on the back of the head the mm -hmm. sensory area not on the motor strip these devices are good for what is called BCI, playing games, controlling stuff on the computer. They're not good for training the brain itself. The software is not up to the task. The dry electrodes or the saline electrodes have to do aggressive filtering of the signal to get clean data. Filtering data smears things in time. So no, unfortunately, you can't do neurofeedback with these devices yet. What one homework assignment would you give people today to begin working on their minds? Let me give you a little bit of homework. And let me give you an environmental cue. Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity to be mindful lots of places. You know, yeah, you can sit on a cushion and, and chant or watch your breath and meditate. But after you learn the basics, I challenge people to expand the frame and take that practice off the cushion. If you're in the checkout line at a supermarket, well, you're there. Stop and drop into mindful attention. No one can tell. No one's going to care. But Every time you find you have a moment, try to find that anchored balance place you may have achieved in some mindfulness. So one little uh, trick, every time you touch a doorknob or go through a door, try to summon that centered, balanced, less reactive place. Like and we, hit, we, we touch doorknobs all day long. So you'll have five or 10 or 15 little reminders to, oh yeah, mindfulness. Even like take one breath where you're watching the full inhale and watching the full exhale. Every time you pass through a door, do that. This will remind you to re-elicit that mindful resource frequently. Awesome, thank you. Three real quick wrap-up questions. First off, what's your URL? So um, folks can find me at peakbraininstitute.com, and we have physical offices in St. Louis, at Peak Brain St. Louis, and uh, also Los Angeles, a couple offices and technicians living all over the world doing concierge work. So if you want some neurofeedback or some QEG work, let us know. Um, you can look me up as well on Twitter at Andrew Hill PhD. So those give you a couple of good places to hunt us down and tell us all your cool brain stories. Woohoo! Two last questions. First off, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really got to be um, doing the job I'm doing now. You know, I love working with somebody who's had all kinds of challenges for 20 years, ADHD, anxiety, some Asperger's, some, you know, some OCD, and I map their brain, and one, I say, oh, look, here's some real stuff, and they go, oh, it's not my fault. So we, we pull the stigma of any variability, first of all. That's an incredible experience for me to go, look at all that guilt that just got lifted. And two, a couple of weeks in, when things start to really change in their brain and somebody walks in and says, oh my God, I had the best day, the most productive, the most calm, the most flexible day yesterday that I've had my, my entire life. And I got more done yesterday than I have in the past three years. Oh my God. You know, I get those kind of like life changing experiences reported back to me more often than not, you know, 80% of the time maybe. And so we love those. We always kind of wait for them. And when they show up, we're kind of like, oh, great, wonderful. And so that's incredibly fulfilling. And it's also sort of diametrically opposed to my experience of working in inpatient psych, which was people coming back, revolving door, managing their suffering, managing mental illness, but not necessarily ever making massive change. And here people come in and often work with me for three or four months and leave without ADHD, without OCD, without seizures, without migraines. Um, without any limits on their creativity or their flexibility of cognition. So for me, it's about bringing the tools to people and helping them get the changes they want. When that happens, and it does most of the time in neurofeedback, it's incredibly fulfilling. So it's really no coincidence that I've uh, ended up as an entrepreneur in the neurofeedback space because it's just it's, it feels like cheating a little bit, Michael, compared to everything else I've done in mental health. Because it's so quick, it's so reliable, and it usually works. Um, so uh, it brings me great joy just to do my job. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And any last words of wisdom, I'll call it, for brain hacking today? Yeah, the only thing I would say is a perspective of change is important. 
You know, if you are anxious, if you are stuttering, if you have migraines, if you have seizures, if, if you aren't as creative or as flexible as you want to be, if your brain is slowed down because you're 75 years old, um, these are not things you need to tolerate. Your brain changes. Shift happens. So it's not a question of is your brain going to change. It's how is it going to change. You can take control of that. You, you do have responsibility and ability to do things to your brain and experience in a matter of days and weeks different resources. So don't be satisfied with bottlenecks of performance, with your mind running away with you, with feeling depressed or anxious. Find ways to engage with tools and techniques and really engage. Oh, one last thing. Um, I said there's nothing that's really neurofeedback valid mm -hmm. in the consumer devices, but there is peripheral biofeedback that works quite well. The biggest difference is, is that peripheral is voluntary. You must keep practicing to keep the skill. Okay. Where neurofeedback is involuntary, once the brain's tuned up, you can go on and live your life with new resources. There's a device um, from HeartMath called the EM Wave Pro. Mm -hmm. And I don't like their other devices, actually. I find problems with using them. But the Pro, I think, is an amazing device. All of my neurofeedback stations and all the offices have a Pro plugged into it. Um, HRV, heart rate variability, is a form of neurofeedback that affects the brain, the heart, and the gut. And you train the vagus nerve, the reactive tone of the system that ties the whole physiology and perspective on arousal into a better regulatory mode. So if you want to do low-cost, home-based stuff, HRV is the way to go, not neurofeedback. There's a game I used maybe 10 years ago. They still have it around today. I checked before this interview called Wild Divine. Oh, sure, yeah. And, and that uses HRV, I guess, on the earlobe in theory. Yeah, or, or, or the fingertips. I mean, as long as you measure the pulse, it doesn't matter where you learn, uh, where you measure HRV or heart rate. Um, Wild Divine uses a combination of HRV and GSR, galvanic skin response, which is a measure of stress, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, like a so, lie detector. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so if you train GSR and HRV, you get really good decrease of stress. So um, I've never used Wild Divine. Uh, one of my offices had one of the devices. I never actually picked it up. Um, I've heard good things about it. So yes, I would guess that the Wild Divine is a good way to go after you know, fun, gentle biofeedback, um, as would like an EM Wave Pro only uh, is what I like for actual sort of biofeedback devices. A little more data comes out of the M Wave than comes out of the Wild Divine. So Wild Divine is more of a game. So you have a five-year-old kid who needs some HRV, Wild Divine's the way to go. If you're a high-powered executive who needs to shut off your mind at night and you can't get into some, for some neurofeedback, pick up an M Wave Pro. And over time, you'll get more control over that vagal tone of physiologic arousal. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. This has been really um, strengthening for the brain, shall we say. <laughs> well, my pleasure, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Fantastic. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, start training your brain today, and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments, have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>